uh, someone who's well known as an influence on Tolkien, but is a modern writer. William Morris, can you can you say a little bit first about who he was and uh, kind of the, the the broad scope? And he was a Tolkien like figure in some respects in the the broad scope of his his talent, I suppose. Yeah, Morris is quite an interesting figure. I mean, he's um you know he's a nineteenth century um, writer known today actually mostly for his um his artistic designs his wallpaper designs his fabric designs i've got a bunch of william morris dishcloths um for instance uh but he was also a prolific um writer of fantasies and sort of historical fantasies um which are, have been republished some some of them have been republished mainly from because of tolkien um and he was also very politically involved he was a dedica dedicated socialist um founded the arts and crafts movement so very much kind of a renaissance figure in you know the mid 19th um mid 19th century and he's someone that more that uh, tolkien read quite early on um, as an undergraduate uh, at oxford and was really struck by what morris was doing um and it's it's one of the earliest really clear um and clearly identified by Tolkien examples of influence on his work. Because he even says in the letter to Edith that he decided to model um, a poem, a, a work that he was doing um, on Morris's writings. And so we, we know now that it was the Fall Gondolin um, and Fall Gondolin was explicitly modeled on the mixed prose and verse style of Morris's book, The House of the Wolfings that Tolkien had acquired about that time. So yeah, this is something that becomes a staple of Tolkien's fiction writing. This this intersperse uh, prose and poetry. Um, one of the things that you discuss in the book, which is also covered um, in even more detail in uh, the book The Ring of Words, which is about Tolkien's work on the Oxford English Dictionary, a really interesting book, uh, is the influence from Morris and some other nineteenth century writers. I think George Dasent Dasent is another one of them. Um, in their use of archaism. So these are writings, writers who are playing around with archaic language, sometimes invented, sometimes real. Um, in the case of Dasent, he's making up what he believes to be like lost Anglo-Saxon words to replace Latinate. I think he's the guy who came who who came up with a uh, uh, foreword instead of a preface. If uh, I believe he he coined the term foreword. Um, so they use archaism. Um, but Tolkien kind of takes it and refines it and uses it with greater specificity of intention. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, he, he handles it in a really sophisticated way. And this is, this was a fascinating aspect to trace in Tolkien's modern reading because Tolkien engaged with Morris again, very early on. And we see that influence in his earliest writings and he continues reading Morris through his whole life. He owned a whole bunch of Morris's books, um, right about a dozen of them. Um, and so we see the way that he engages with Morris as a young man, and he's very heavily influenced. I mean, it's almost, you know, a pastiche, it's so close. And Morris is incredibly archaic. I mean, he is just loaded down with making the whole, everything sounds extremely archaic. And we see that um, in, say, The Fall of Gondolin and some of the early tales of, of the Legendarium, Tolkien just, just going whole hog on that. But then we see that as Tolkien matures as a writer, and this is fascinating to see, as he matures as a writer, he becomes much more selective in the way that he uses archaic language. Now, Morris keeps that same register the same way in all of his books. <laughs> it's, he, he never tones it down and there's no variation. But by the time Tolkien gets to writing The Lord of the Rings, he's shifted to a much more sophisticated handling where he uses archaism much more sparingly and he uses it very deliberately to shift the tone, to, to, to kind of shift the mood of a scene and then you know, move on to something else. And that's, that I think says a lot about Tolkien's skill as a writer, um, that he, he wasn't committed to just using archaism for its own sake. In fact, I turned up, um, he was commenting at one point to a, a, a poet about preparing some Chaucerian texts for, uh, for reading in a public performance. And he makes the case that it's actually better to modernize some of the pronunciation so that the audience can better understand mm. it. Um, he was also right. involved with helping out with the um, translation of 
um, the new version of the Jerusalem Bible. He um, he actually translated the, the book of Jonah. And interestingly, in corresponding with um, the editors there, he supported the case for using you instead of using thee and thou, um, because he felt that this would be more, you know, more fitting for the reader, more helpful for the reader. So we see by the end of his life that, you know, by, well, by, by his mature um, point in his life for his writing, that Tolkien really had this nuanced view of like using it very sparingly. Um, and so I think that's a, a really good example of the way that he works with an influence. You know, he, he definitely drew a lot of that archaism from Morris, but he didn't just bring it over. He, he experiment, yeah. experimented with it and, and made something much, much better. It's something I hear people say all the time. You know, Tolkien writes in this one high, uh, you know, pompous style all the time. It's just not true. If no. you read, maybe a little more true of the Silmarillion, I think. Um, but uh, if you read Lord of the Rings, I mean, give me a break. He he modulates his tone all the time in that. Yeah, I think um, it's because so we are I, so yeah. we're so used to a low tone, um, a sort of a, a you know, in all of our all of our things we read now, that when we encounter any of the higher register, it's so striking that the, that someone who maybe already has a bias against Tolkien is much more likely to sort of glance at it, see a little bit of a higher register, and assume like, oh yeah, that's that fantasy stuff, all these and those and what's not what not. But no, he he's very deft. And he uses it really remarkably sparingly um, in the Lord of the Rings. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like somebody seeing a priest investments and saying it's a dress. You know, it's that kind of kind of reaction. There's also some specific elements of the Lord of the Rings, some plot elements, characters that you you see as uh, as influenced by Morris. And let me let me preface that by saying actually you make a big point in this book of discussing only works that we can be certain that Tolkien read or at least owned a copy of. Uh, so there is some speculation as to how these things may have influenced in some cases, although sometimes he says so explicitly, but it, you know, we're not just, it's not just a complete speculation here. It, we know that he, he read these works. Uh, so you talk about uh, the influence on the character of Eowyn. Can you, can you go into that? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that was a fascinating piece to turn up because he names The Roots of the Mountains, um, one of Morris's books, as an influence on The Lord of the Rings. And in The Roots of the Mountains, there's this fascinating character called the Bride, who is in love with one hero, is jilted by him, goes to battle despairingly, um, you know, hoping to die, um, says it's basically worthless to be a woman. She wants to just be, you know, a, a warrior. She's wounded and, and then she ends up, um, you know, falling in love with and marrying um, another warrior who has been devoted to her the whole time. So there's there's a definite similarity in personality and arc with Eowyn, Aragorn, and Faramir, although Aragorn is, you know, treats her well, doesn't jilt her like this, uh, this character does in uh, The Roots of the Mountains. Um, but there's a lot, especially in the bride's speech where she you know, says, I'm, I'm sick of being a woman. I don't want to stay home. That's worthless. I'm going to go out and fight. It's remarkably similar to Eowyn's speech um, in, her, in her despair. Um, but again, it's very interesting to note the way that Tolkien works with it. Um, I think there's definitely enough, enough in terms of parallels. Since we know that he read this book and he names it as an influence, we can, I think, very realistically say that that there's a connection. But what does Tolkien do? He actually makes Eowyn more empowered, more of a significant figure. So um, rather than just sort of passively, um, you know, sort of passively going out and 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 fighting, if I can say that, um, um, Eowyn is actually actively chosen by um, her father, her uncle. Sorry, um, to you know, be the one who's in charge of the of the people who are left um, behind. You know, when they go on to Helm's Deep, she's she's staying behind, but she's staying behind and she's in charge um, as opposed to just, you know, kind of taking her, you know, her place by happenstance. And we see a much more well-rounded picture of Eowyn. She's a much more three-dimensional character with an inner life, whereas the bride and another similar character in um, The House of the Wolfings is very flat, a very flat sort of stereotypical female character. So again, we see that Tolkien, you know, I think is quite probably getting some ideas from Morris, 
but he's making his woman warrior have an inner life, have more recognition from the men in her life, have a more serious, significant role in the story. Everything he does with Eowyn makes her a stronger and more interesting woman in his, in his story.